Welcome to Face the State. I'm Ariana Bennett. Thank you for joining us. Well, after a policy change effectively shut down the rooftop solar industry in Nevada back in 2015, a new law could bring it back to life. But it's not all sunny for solar initiatives. The governor also gave a big thumbs down to a major priority for solar advocates. Tom Policalis from the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project is here now to talk about all of that. Tom, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, now we had you on at the beginning of the session to kind of talk about all these clean energy priorities. Now the session's over. How are you feeling about how it all went overall? Well, the backdrop is really the people of Nevada did win. People engaged, uh, citizens became involved and saw that they could have an influence on public policy. So I think that's the greatest victory that's come out of it is that people have a, a sense of power and that their legislators represent them quite effectively. If they're going to get involved in the process, then they can see actually great results as demonstrated by a number of energy bills. Now, you were basically living at the legislature during the session, and you said you were there for just about every hearing. You testified for how many different bills were you going after? Uh, we had uh, probably 13 or 14 that we were tracking, 11 of which did pass. And uh, this is kind of a successful culmination to a process that started with Governor Sandoval's commissioning the new Energy Industry Task Force. And that was more than a year ago when following the PUC's decision to essentially disrupt the rooftop solar industry, the governor convened a task force and I had the opportunity of serving on the Clean Energy Technical Advisory Committee. And that process really also embraced a number of stakeholders across the state. And a lot of the policies that have been recently signed into law was the culmination of that process that uh, the governor started a long time ago. So it's been a long time coming, but uh, really I think great things are happening for the state of Nevada. Yeah, big change, especially when, we, when it comes to rooftop solar. The issue initially was that net metering, right? So the rate that solar users got paid back for the extra energy they produced got cut dramatically, made it so that it was no longer cost effective to put solar panels on your home, right? That's correct. So this legislation that was signed into law, AB 405, brought back net metering to a great value for homeowners that are choosing to go solar. It also provided for a consumer bill of rights because back in the day there were some uh, concerns with the way that some of the solar systems were being sold and uh, perhaps not on a straightforward basis in some cases. So this is a great way to protect both consumers and to also have more distributed generation which is valuable to all Nevadans whether you go solar or not. Yeah, and the effect was pretty much immediate. We already started hearing from companies who had left Nevada um, after the 2015 PUCN decision, and now they're coming back because they said, okay, now we see business coming back to the state. And um, so I think probably safe to say it's going to create some jobs. A lot of jobs. When you take a look at the impact from the 2015 decisions and uh, the results, uh, hundreds of jobs were lost. So we're hoping to see those uh, recuperated and then built on. And as you know, anytime you have a job in the solar industry, that's going to lead to a multiplier effect with other jobs being created. So this is a tremendous economic development opportunity for the state and one that we'd like to see capitalized on with uh, some of the other er energy legislation and new technologies are becoming more and more economical. Yeah, bipartisan support on that one too. Tremendous. And I think that's because uh, your Nevada voter really supports solar. The polls that went back to the day when energy choice was being studied by pollsters. There was as much support for rooftop solar as there was for energy choice. We know that that was 72 point something percent of uh, Nevada voters went for energy choice. A good argument can be made is that's the percentage of Nevadans that want to see a rooftop solar back and now they have their desires as expressed by the legislature and signed into law by the governor. Yeah, okay. Now, unfortunately, on the other side of the coin, another big initiative that solar advocates wanted was community solar. And that's those solar, um, you know, kind of communal solar gardens where, um, like, neighborhoods maybe or could tap Schools, in. churches, Schools, church, yeah, yeah okay, number. That and that, the community solar opportunity was really for those of us that, as myself, I live in an apartment. I can't put a solar panel on my landlord's roof. Uh, other folks that have shade trees or something that prohibits them from having a good solar access. So it could be a project that would be out of school or a church or any type of uh, shared facility and then we could have helped those uh, local excuse me centralized locations put in more panels and then we would have received the benefit from the solar installations that were done on a community basis so that did get the thumbs down and so there's uh, we want to keep the discussion going and uh, provide more education to what that could do for Nevada too for the uh, both the upcoming election and the 2019 session yeah now the governor vetoed that one but in his veto message he did say he has nothing against community so 
solar. He likes the idea. He just thought it was uh, maybe too much too soon and too disruptive to a system that's already undergoing a ton of change. You can't deny that. I mean, obviously, our energy industry in Nevada is undergoing a ton of change. Certainly. And as the electric system evolves with the potential for more distributed generation and the potential for energy choice coming up fairly soon, I understand that perspective. I think uh, having done community solar in another state, that uh, it's kind of, uh, it, it can be done in incremental steps, but that's again something that we'll need to build on in education. I think that uh, we've got a lot of um, additional uh, details to go into, how it impacts people that are not participating in solar, if that imposes any cost, which our research found did not. And uh, when I say that our research, this is something that I participated in with clean energy advocates, not for Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, only focused on the efficiency bills. But uh, a number of testimonies describe that really when you've got more distributed generation in a neighborhood, so if we had a, a large array at a school, that that provides voltage support, you're eliminating transmission costs, you're uh, eliminating the need for additional generation. So there's a number of benefits to non-solar rate payers when you have community solar arrays. So we want to get that information out over the course of the next two years and see if we can come back in uh, 2019 and get it signed into law. Yeah, because the concern, obviously, with, with the net metering also was if you um, have you know widespread use of, of solar, that it's going to drive up costs for traditional energy users. Um, and you found that to be not the case? That's, that's a perception. So what we're finding is the value of solar, particularly distributed solar, has a tremendous benefit to the local community. There's a number of benefits it provides in terms of, again, avoiding transmission cost. There's some benefits to the distribution system. There's one of the key factors that we take into consideration, those being advocates for those technologies, is the national security benefit. We find that our community is more resilient when we have more power generation close to where it's used, and that's something that, uh, in my personal opinion, has a high value. We want to make the overall grid more resilient and uh, less, th uh, less um, vulnerable? vulnerable to disruption, whether it be by weather or by human elements that are working you know, against uh, the, the security of our society. So. Right. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see how this is all going to shape up. It's a it's a big, big part of change. Um, now that wasn't the only bill either that um, the governor vetoed that was kind of involved in all of this. AB 206 is the other one. That one had some pretty lofty goals. Wanted to get Nevada's energy production up to 40 percent uh, renewable by I think was it 2030? Yes. Yes, 2030. So what do you think? Too ambitious? Uh, not from my perspective. And a number of the energy advocates uh, find that Nevada is abundant in renewable energy resources sources, both solar, geothermal, and actually wind in some areas, and that uh, we certainly have the technical potential to achieve even beyond 40 percent from renewable energy resources. Uh, part of the concern or the issue became how much we're going to rely on natural gas fire generation. Our trend right now is to have more than 60 percent of our electric generation fired by natural gas, which us advocates believe is a risky strategy given that there are a number of studies that say that natural gas is going to rise in price because American producers gas is now going to hit international markets. Uh, there's liquefied natural gas terminals, tremendous amount of literally billions of dollars of gas that's going to be exported to Asian and European markets where the price is higher. And when you export natural gas produced in America to those markets, the expectation is that natural gas is going to be a resource that is increasingly expensive as we look to 2030. So it's kind of a risk analysis from uh, some uh, extent, but we think that there was the opportunity to put a lot more renewable energy into place. So again, that's going to be something that we'll continue to work on and educate over the next two years too. Yeah, and Nevada already has that standard at 25% by 2025, so they are doing something. It's yes, not, definitely. Just not 40%. Correct, and uh, the, the signal to some developers that Nevada was really ready to embrace additional economic development, that's something that a number of advocates focused on. And uh, also some of the testimony related to the national security implications, where we want to see that when Nevada can produce more of its own power, that makes us, again, less vulnerable to what the supply of natural gas uh, does on the international market, provides a number of other uh, you know, buying local and having uh, local resources is something that tends to produce more resiliency and has some benefits that I don't think that uh, everyone really studied. So opportunities for additional education on a number of these issues. Yeah, well, since all this stuff passed really without um, a ton of opposition and, and almost all of them with bipartisan partisan support, um, Obviously, we can imagine they're not going to completely disappear, even if they didn't um, all go into law at this session. So um, 
do you see them just resurfacing in 2019 at that session, or do you see them coming up before then, possibly on the ballot? Well, certainly industry is actively pursuing a number of projects. We know of projects east of Reno where geothermal is being developed and then exported to California. So there, there is activity that's going on. Um, so you're not going to slow down the private sector when they perceive opportunities. I have not heard yet of anything going on to the ballot. That certainly is a possibility, but nothing of which I'm aware. But uh, certainly I think that there is the, the need for everyone to become more in-depth in uh, into the issue of what the economics are and what the risks are when we are importing so much of our power. Okay. And community solar, you think that one's going to pop back up? I am completely convinced that community solar will be an issue that comes back in uh, 2019. And I guess for the, as we have a, an election in 2018 coming up, hopefully some of the candidates that are going to be running will start addressing these issues fairly early on. Yeah, well, we'll see. Okay, Tom, you sit right there. We'll be back, though. We're going to talk about more of this stuff. There's a lot more to discuss when it comes to clean energy policy. We're going to break down some new laws for you and what it all means for you. That's right after the break.